When I was a little girl, my mother gave me a piece of advice that stuck with me over the years. If you learn to read, you can do anything you want to. For some odd reason, my third grade self really decided to take this to heart, and I would come home every day from school carrying this huge stack of books. One day my mom decided to ask me why on earth I was doing this, and I looked up at her with all the snark and sincerity of my eight-year-old self and said, this is in case Ms. Taylor needs help tomorrow. Over the years, my love of reading and books only grew, and when I got to college, I discovered all the different ways you could experience a book. There was the iPad, the Kindle, the laptop, the desktop, and even a USB flash drive that would carry hundreds of books. So then the question became, if I can carry 50 to 100 books across campus without breaking my back, why on earth would I ever read a paper book again? In my usual quest-like fashion, I turned to Google, where there apparently were about two different answers to this question. The first was that feelings are the best way to go about it. Books feel better. When we read a book, we connect with it better. So we should read paper books. And then the second part of that is convenience. We can carry hundreds of books at a time. And feelings aren't really an argument anyway. But paper books haven't really gone away. They're still very prevalent even now. So can we actually learn better? Are feelings quantifiable? When I was in high school, I had this wonderful math teacher named Mr. Derek Owens. And me being as absent-minded then as I am now, I would usually forget my lecture notes. He never hesitated to print off copies for me to read along what he was teaching that day. And one of the kids ne next to me decided to ask him why he was so OK doing this. His response was pretty short and something to the effect of, you use more paper, you save more trees. The kid was a little confused by this, so he decided to explain it further. If you have a can of beans that you're preparing for dinner and you eat the beans, you're not depleting the world of its bean supply because the guy on the farther end, way down the road, who's growing the beans, well, he's understanding that you, aren't, you need more beans, so he's just going to grow some more. In that same way, we been, begin to misunderstand paper and trees in the same way. Before paper became what we know as tree paper, we had about 4,500 years of different things. We had clay tablets and stone tablets, and we had writing on walls, and we had all sorts of different things. In fact, it wasn't until 1850 that we even had paper made out of trees. And we didn't even have the iPad until the 2000s. So. So then we look at paper books totally differently than they were originally thought of. Uh, paper books were this huge academic source of knowledge. So can we learn better from them? Once again, I wasn't the only person to ask this question. A woman named Anne Mangan at the University of Stavanger in Norway decided to explore this with a group of 10th graders. She divided the group up in two parts. And one part received a paper version of a document, and the other received an e-book version of the document. Well, the paper book version, or the paper version of the document, they read slower, but they read much better. Their comprehension scores were significantly higher than their counterparts. James Madison University also followed this up by doing another study very similar to this one. They opened it by polling the general student body and found that 75% actively admitted to liking paper books more. They topped that off by using some of their fancy heavy-duty eye tracking software where they monitored people's eye movements across the page. And what they found was that when you read something on paper, you read word for word, line for line, down to the bottom of the page. But when you read something on an electronic screen, we tended to read the entire first line, a little bit of the middle, and the bottom line. It, looked, it ended up looking kind of like an E or an F pattern. And that's part of the reason why, if you ever take a business writing class, they'll tell you to stick to one line for business emails. So we retain more information. It is actually a fact. So then why? Well, for most people, psychology is involved in many whys in our life. And I decided to check there, too. Well, it turns out we connect differently with paper than we do on a psychological level, even. When we read a brightly lit screen, our body doesn't relax the same way. For example, when you're going to bed at night, your body produces something called melatonin. It's a hormone in the body produced by the pineal gland that allows you to go to sleep and wake up at about the same time every day. 
And when you stare at a screen, your body doesn't produce that same hormone because it sees that it's still daytime. And over time, for those of us who do the 2 a.m. to 4 a.m. night writing shift in college, I know none of you have ever done that in your lives, I'm sure, it becomes very distracting and can eventually lead to insomnia, which is linked to depression. Additionally, touching a paper book and picking it up and cracking the spine and going through all of that, the way that we experience that is very different. Humans have a noticeably different connection with something you can touch. There was a study done in France, which is one of the most medically, com medically compliantly low countries in, the, in Europe for um, a group of patients that were given penicillin for pharyngitis, which is a condition where your pharynx is inflamed. So in this group, they were trying to determine the effect of touch in relationship to patients and how that works. Did, would it affect them? Well, they divided the group up into two. And one group had the same instructions as the other group, but they received a one to two second touch on the forearm along with the instructions to finish their medication. The other group didn't receive any sort of contact, but the same wording. What they found at the end of just seven days and one to two seconds of contact was that there was a noticeable improvement in the patients who had received the contact. Can you imagine just one to two seconds of contact and we have a noticeable difference over seven days of compliance? Can you imagine then what we could do with years and years of books, of cracking the spines, of smelling the pages, of all those wonderful things? Regardless of what you take away from today, I'd just like to remind you of the joy of reading. I'd like to remind you of that time when you begged your parents to read you that bedtime story for the 13th time. I'd like to remind you of when you were a teenager and you fell in love with a character that didn't even exist and you were sad when the book ended. None of this, by the way, is to say that I hate technology in any shape, form, or fashion. In fact, it's due to many of the medical advances in technology within the past few years that have allowed me to stand up here right now and give you this talk. I'd also like to thank TEDx Kennesaw State University for live streaming this. My family in Venezuela, South America right now is able to watch this because of them. So the next time you go down to Starbucks and you're sitting there with your book, whether it's an iPad, a Kindle, a paper book, or even a stone tablet, just remember to read. In the words of Joseph Brodsky, the famous Russian-American essayist, there are worse crimes than burning books. One of them is simply not reading. Thank you.